shame. Well, good morning, church family. Good morning. How are we doing? This holiday weekend. I know kids are already back in school. So, yeah, well, the kids are unhappy. <laughs> Except for Tyler. Tyler's in college, man. It's, can you believe it? Started college this week. Praise God. I miss going to college, quite frankly. I don't miss high school at all. <laughs> but I do miss college. So, praise the Lord. Um, a couple of announcements. Wednesday evening prayer and Bible study. We are still here, folks. 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, 30 minutes for prayer. And, you know, 45, well, maybe another 10 minutes after that for uh, prayer requests. And then about 40 minutes or so of uh, Bible study. So uh, you are always welcome here for that. We are doing a series called uh, The Truth in True Crime. It is uh, by a retired homicide detective. And every week he gives us the details of a, uh, of a uh, case that he worked as a detective. And he brings out biblical truth from those cases. It's been very interesting so far. So uh, you guys are welcome to join us for that. Uh, Operation Christmas Child. It is uh, almost Labor Day, so now is the time to be thinking about Christmas, right? <laughs> so <laughs> if you ask my wife, the time to think about Christmas was December 26th. You know, <laughs> she started the countdown already. Uh, but yeah, it is about that time, so... Uh, the, ca the calendar is moving, uh, moving quite fast. Uh, so uh, sometime at the end of October, we will be doing the box packing. Uh, as always, uh, as I've told you, our goal is 150 boxes. And half of those boxes for the 10 to 14 year olds. So bear that in mind. Um, so, you know, when you, if you're going to donate like coloring books, um, think about the 10 to 14 year old group. Um, crayons are great, but coloring pencils would be even better. Um, so, uh, actually, Elaine, do you know, did you, were you able to do the inventory? Like yes. today? We don't need any more notebooks. We don't need any more notebooks. Praise God. All right. We still need about 100 washcloths. Okay, we need washcloths. That's definitely no, important. We don't have I just bought 36 more. Oh. I brought them today. Okay, so 36 okay, more washcloths. All right, how many did we need before that? Like 96. Okay, so minus the 34 that you just bought? 36. 36. So we need 60 washcloths. Uh, we have plenty of soap, but, you know, we need washcloths to go with the soap, right? <laughs> so, okay, so we still need washcloths, but praise God, we're getting there. No notebooks, we have plenty of toys as far as stuffed animals and things like that. Um, we do need soccer balls, I'm assuming, or basketball balls. Yeah, Okay. We need more toothbrushes. Okay. So we need more toothbrushes, more uh, pencils. balls, hmm? pencils, and pencils. Can't you know? It's a, um, I have a a whole box of like two hundred. I was thinking it could have like three in a little those bag that you seal yeah, with. Yeah, absolutely. It, with the, that's one. That if I do it that way, because mm -hmm. it came in bulk, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Yeah. So we we'll, need, we'll need pencil sharpeners as well. Okay. So because every box, yeah. Three pencils and I sharpen it inside and close it. That would That's fine. Okay. Absolutely. They have to be new or not. Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah it has they to be. be. They have to be new. Oh, they're new. Okay. So what happened is I, I buy a, a, it came in a whole box. Okay. And they they're not like little packages. Excellent. Excellent. They're brand new. Yeah, as long as they haven't been used, they're, they're perfect. Um, yeah, uh, so every every box should have a pencil sharpener and an, and an eraser. Now, a lot of those pencils do come with erasers, but we like to put in like little erasers as well, because those erasers that come with the pencils, they don't last very long. <laughs> they definitely don't last as long as the pencil itself, right? <laughs> so, uh, okay. I think that's it. Balls is the, the one thing. So uh, if you're going to donate a ball, we got to have pumps to go with it, the little miniature pumps, because remember, we're talking about our shoe bumps. We're not talking about a big box, we're talking about a shoe box. So just bear that in mind. Um, so I'll probably be buying some soccer balls uh, coming up over the next couple of weeks, uh, but I'm definitely not buying on it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so keep that in mind. The donations are also uh, welcome uh, because every box uh, that we donate, we, have to, we also have to donate $10 to assist with the, uh, the cost of shipping. So, you know, 150 boxes times $10 a box, that's $1,500. So, uh, 
you know, and keep that in mind as well. Do we have enough boxes? We do not, but I will be ordering the boxes as well this uh, this week probably. Do we boxes have and the letters. Do we have to pay for the boxes? No, they provide them for free. We just have to pay for the uh, shipping Perfect. to us. So. We need to pay for the boxes or no? No, no. no. Um, at least I don't think so. Whatever the cost is, we'll pay for the boxes. <laughs> I think the cost is like minimal, it's like pennies per box, if, if there is a cost. If I remember correctly, they don't charge for the boxes, uh, but they, you know, we just have to pay for the shipping. But my, my memory isn't, <laughs> isn't what it used to be yet, so I think that's right. So uh, if I'm wrong, hey, it's not the first time. So. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions on that? So, okay, so washcloths, uh, pencils, erasers, huh? Toothbrushes, wa uh, and balls. So, and we're getting there. I mean, we started off last year with just a few things. Now we're, we're, we're getting there. So the, the toothbrushes, do they have to be wrapped? Or yes, yes, they have to be new, brand new toothbrushes in the package. Got it. So that's hard to get. I mean, individual wrapped ones. I mean, you can buy them in bulk. Well, I know that my wife just recently bought two brushes. They came individually wrapped, but they were connected. So like they, they had the wrapping where the, the cardboard on the back was like connected, and then all you had to do was break them off. Okay. Um, so they do come like that. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's a it's a hygiene thing. They have to be in in the in the original wrapping. So. Any other questions? So I will let you know the, the specific date. More than likely going to be the last Saturday in October uh, because the uh, collection is mid-November and we want to give ourselves a couple of weeks in case we're missing any like little little items. So uh, more to come on that. I think that's it. Any other announcements? Am I missing anything, Juanita? No, we're good. All right. You might want to mention, it, 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 I know it's only uh, Instagram and all that, but the fact that we are providing child care downstairs. Yes, that's good. Thank you. That's that's right. We uh, we have restarted our kids program. Uh, Marielle is is our kids uh, program leader, and she is doing a great job. So we do have now we have child care now. Mm -hmm. So uh, absolutely, and that is up on the Instagram and uh, and the Facebook because it's it's connected. So. Um, at least I think she did put that on the Instagram, right? Yeah. Okay, good. I haven't looked at it recently, yeah, so that's why. There's actually asking. pictures of the kids, Excellent. you know, playing, coloring, and whatnot, uh, and in the uh, in the Bible study too. Excellent. 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 So good. Yeah, Marielle does a great job with that. So, anything else? All right, so we're going to continue our Bible study or our series on Bible characters that we never talk about. And today we're going to talk about Shifra and Pua. Pop quiz, who remembers who those people are? <laughs> Does anybody? Uh, <laughs> nobody remembers? See, this is, why, this is why I'm doing this Bible series, right? Because these are people we never talk about. Shifra and Pua are the midwives that uh, were assisting the Israelites during the, cap, uh, the uh, slavery in Egypt. Now, the Bible isn't clear on whether they were Egyptian or whether they were Hebrew. I tend to think they were Egyptian, uh, but that's just my opinion. I, there's nothing in the Bible that tells us whether or not they were, they were Hebrew women or they were Egyptian women. But the, uh, the important thing is, is that they were midwives, and they helped women in childbirth. Now, and this is the reason why I think these were Egyptian midwives because they uh, they they mentioned Egyptian the Egyptian uh, women uh, giving birth when uh, they were talking to Pharaoh. So I don't think Pharaoh would have Hebrew midwives assisting Egyptian women in childbirth. That again, just my opinion. This is not Bible, so you do with that whatever you wish. Okay. Anyway, so in uh, Exodus 1, verses 15 through 17, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. 
but if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. So these this, these are the two women we're going to be talking about today. Now, the, the Bible further uh, goes on to say that uh, Pharaoh did question these women about letting the Hebrew uh, boys live. And the women told them, say, hey, Pharaoh, you know, Hebrew women aren't like Egyptian women. So when they go into labor, they have their babies real fast, right? <laughs> and uh, and, and they, they have the babies before we're even able to get them. Now, the Bible says that, that Pharaoh did not punish these women. And it also says that because they feared the Lord, the Lord allowed them to have families of their own. So it is possible, again, just my opinion, it is possible that up until this point, these, these women were barren. And because they feared the Lord and they, they refused to, to follow Pharaoh's edict, uh, God allowed them to have children. So, all right, so that's the story. So what do you think we can learn from that story? Now that you guys remember the story, right? Because you all, once I told you that, right, you all remember that. I, I saw you guys nodding like, oh, yeah, I remember now. <laughs> what do you think we can learn from that? Nice well, and long. The fear of God is, is more than, or should be more than the fear of men. Because what God can do for you or to you. <laughs> is way more greater or severe than anything that man can do. And that is an excellent point. Where, and that is actually my very first point. So I have two others besides that. Anybody want to guess what the other two points are? There are no wrong answers, guys. Come on, just take a guess. Yeah. You're among friends here. No? Nobody brave enough? So what you're telling me then is that I have failed as a pastor. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, here. Go ahead. There's always a blessing in obeying God. Okay, there you go. That's that's the third point. Okay? So you got two out of three. See, I told you there are no wrong answers. <laughs> Just give it a try. Anybody else want to take a take a stab at it? I will admit my my, my second point on this is a little obscure. So I, it's, it's okay if you don't get it. Go ahead. God will uh, confound the plans of the enemy. All right. I don't actually have that written down, but I like that one. <laughs> that goes, I think that goes along with the fear of the Lord, though. But we'll, we'll continue talking about that. Anybody else? You want to try? I, I, no, you don't. Know, it's, right. it's, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay, guys. All right. So let's talk about the fear of the Lord, right? So that's the first thing we, we understand. Uh, from this story is, is we must fear the Lord more than we fear people. And that is, that is absolutely relevant today uh, because so many churches, because they fear uh, the backlash of people, so many churches are giving up on teaching the Word of God. And they are compromising on, uh, on the morality that is taught in, in God's Word. Because they fear people. They fear being uh, having a bad reputation. It's hilarious because I heard this, I want to say, 30 years ago. Actually, even longer than that. It had to be almost 40, probably. 35 to 40 years ago, I heard a preacher once say that the church endured persecution. But will it endure being unpopular? And, and that was 35 years ago, guys. And here we are in the 21st century, and we have our answer. The answer is no. The church is able to endure persecution, but we have not been able to endure being unpopular in the culture. Because so many churches, what they call mainline churches, I love that word. Uh, mainline churches have completely compromised and gone along with the morality that society tells them should be the things that we teach. And, and they have shown that they don't fear the Lord. Now let's talk about the fear of the Lord, right? So when we talk about the fear of the Lord, now when I was growing up, we understood the fear of the Lord a little differently than, than what I teach about the fear of the Lord nowadays. When I was growing up, when we talked about the fear of the Lord, we talked about God just squashing you, right? <laughs> like at any moment you get out of line, God is like, nope, not going to deal with that. That's not the way I teach the fear of the Lord, okay? As I have come to understand 
uh, the scriptures, and especially the word that, that is used here. The Hebrew word for, uh, for fear here is yare. I, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, so forgive me if I'm not. But yare actually could mean reverence instead of like fear, where we understand fear as kind of a trembling type of, of thing, like you're afraid of punishment. Like, you know that feeling when you're speeding down the highway? Look, I know you guys would never do that, right? So, you know that feeling that you're, like, you're speeding down the highway, all of a sudden you see light, uh, cop lights behind you? That's the fear that, that most of us associate with, uh, with this, right, with this concept. It's like, uh-oh, I'm, you know, I'm about to get busted. Right? That's, that's not necessarily... Now look, God is the judge of the earth. And he will punish sin. We understand that. But that's not the fear that we're talking about. When, when I talk about fear, I am talking more in terms of that reverence for God. That respect. The same respect that you would have for a good parent. So like, I respected my... Or I should say, uh, I'll go back to using the word fear, right? I feared my mother growing up. Even though she was four foot eleven, right? <laughs> Strongest person I've ever met. I'll tell you that right now. But anyway, I feared my mother. Why? Not because I was afraid that she was going to beat me. No, my mother was a good mother. I I respected her. That's what we're talking about when we talk about fear. So, and here's the exciting thing, guys. When we talk about that word meaning reverence, right? That is the same word used in Psalms 139.14. It says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So God created you. When God created you, he had great reverence for how you were being formed. This is, this is the concept that David is, is, uh, is trying to convey here. When God formed you, he took it seriously. He was, he was rever you were formed reverently. And, and I, I think that concept is just, it, it absolutely blows my mind. Is that God specifically put me together and he was very reverent about it. He was very serious about it. And he made sure to knit me together in a certain way, just as he had planned from the beginning. And, and that's, that's how I understand now the fear of the Lord. It's that same reverence that we have for God. We have reverence for God more than we have reverence for the culture. We have reverence for God more than we have reverence for the, pre for the president or the governor or the mayor or whatever other political leader or even a pastor. Because if I come up here and I start preaching to you a different gospel than what is written in God's word, then you need to have more reverence for God. And, and either stop coming here or, or take me out of here. If I ever come to you with a gospel other than what's written in God's word, then I shouldn't be here. And you guys should have enough reverence for God to understand that. And look, let's face it, not every pastor thinks that way. I've, I've known a few pastors who think, hey, it's my way or the highway. I'm the man of God, and I decide what happens in this church. And, and look, to each his own. I'm not making any judgments on that, but I have a much different view of being a pastor. Probably because I still don't feel like I should be here, right? Now, look, I, I tell you guys all the time, right? It is a miracle that I'm here. I praise God that I'm here. God raised me up. He forgave me. He restored me. He resurrected me. All those wonderful things that we talk about, right? I am a living embodiment of those things, but I can tell you in a private moment, when I really sit down and think about it, I wonder, what was God thinking? It's like, why would God call me to be a pastor, to preach his word? And yet, that's what he chose. Because I am fearfully, reverently, and wonderfully made. This was God's plan from the beginning. So whatever, when, when you think about that word, Right? When we think about the fear of the Lord, that's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about that, that reverence. When you have reverence for someone or something, you take them seriously, right? You respect that person's opinion. And that's, that's, you know, that's the relationship I have with my mother. Even now, I, am, I just turned 54 years old a couple of weeks ago. 
And even now, when my mother speaks, now look, I'm not going to say I always listen, okay? I'm not going to say that, because my mother will be on, on the computer typing in comments like crazy. I'm not saying I always listen, I, I always will do what she tells me, but I do always listen. I always will give her uh, the respect of listening to what she has to say. So now with God, we do have to obey. Now with God, it's completely different. That God is the final authority. So it is not uh, as we are getting closer and closer to a presidential election. I want you to understand that. It is not the president that has the final say. It is God who has the final say, just as God had the final say in Egypt, even though Pharaoh was all powerful. In Egypt, Pharaoh was so powerful, he was considered a god. People worshipped Pharaoh in Egypt. He was among the gods. When, when Pharaoh died, the reason they built such great monuments to Pharaoh to be buried in was to, to assist his journey into the stars among the gods. That is the kind of reverence that people had for Pharaoh. And yet, here we have these two women. So they live in a society where women aren't valued to begin with. Let's face it. In ancient times, women were just considered property, uh, no, no more, no less. And yet, here these women are, they are boldly disobeying the command of Pharaoh because they fear the Lord. In Proverbs 1, 7, it says, this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So you can't have wisdom without fearing the Lord because, you, you know, once, if you don't have any fear of the Lord, you have no basis on which to form wisdom. And that's why there is no wisdom out in the world. Because the wisdom of the world is, is foolishness. Because it has no fear of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Once you fear the Lord, that's when you have, you can take that journey to finding wisdom. Questions? You guys are contemplative today. <laughs> I can see it on your faces. Anybody got a comment? Before we continue. Um, Speak up. Go ahead. When you said that, it, it reminded me of what I was talking about Wednesday and, and some of the things that God is showing me about myself. If I didn't revere him or care, I wouldn't listen. I wouldn't be hearing or looking to hear what he has to say during my prayer times or I wouldn't have prayer times. Um, so, and it's, so he shows you things and it's like oh opening up your eyes and so you can't get your eyes open if you don't respect your eyes. that's a great point and that that's that makes this more personal right and and thank you for that because that that is we do need to make that connection what does it mean uh the biblical concept of fearing the lord what does that mean in our everyday lives right well that's that's a great example of that if I did not fear the Lord, then I wouldn't bother, you know, looking to see what it is about me that needs to change. You know, and let's face it, guys, change is hard. That's why most people don't bother with it. Okay? I, I, know, I know a lot of people who, you know, they come to the Lord, and they are who they are. And like 20 years later, they are still who they are. And there hasn't been much, you know, much in the way of change there. And look, again, to each his own. I'm not going to make any judgments on that. But I've always believed that God is always at work in us. That there's always a, a better version of me to be attained. And the reason I believe that is because I fear the Lord. When I stand before God, I want to be able to, to know that I did everything that I could to, to reach the, the, the potential that God has in me. To, to accomplish everything that God prepared for. That's so what the Bible says, right? He, he created us for work that he prepared in advance for us to do. So when God wrote my story, and just think about that. God writes a story for each and every one of us. When God writes your story, he has specific work for you to do. And that's why he was so careful in how he put you together. Everything that you feel, everything that you're drawn to, everything that excites you, those are the things God placed inside of you to draw you to the work that he prepared for you. That's, that's an awesome thing to think about, right? But it's also an awesome responsibility. 
It is an awesome responsibility to me to take that seriously. And and look, some of us don't. Some of us don't take that seriously. Some of us think that hey, you know, it's that we did discuss this one time on Wednesday night. It's that concept of good enough, right? It's like, well, I'm good enough. And look, you probably are. I'm not going to make any judgments on that. But again, I always believe that there's something, something even greater that God wants us to reach for. You know, that's a great thing about life, right? Life is about succeeding in the things that you try. And look, 25, 26, 27 years ago, I, I had a problem with road rage. And I tried my best to change. I tried, you know, to, to, to be better. But I couldn't be better. You know why? Because I didn't fear the Lord at that time. When I came back to God, and I began to once again fear the Lord, is when I saw improvement in those things. Now, if I had come back to God and just thought, well, this is who I am, like this is how I was raised, or this is how, you know, this is how I have to be, or this is just my personality, then, you know, here we are 27 years later, I might, I might still have had a problem with road rage. But praise be to God, I feared the Lord. And I decided, no, this is not right. And I fear God, and I want to be that. I want to be the person that God created me to be. And so through a lot of prayer, and a lot of seeking God's help, and, you know, I, little by little, I did get better. And today, I'm the, I'm the most peaceful person on the road you'll ever be. <laughs> and I never thought that was possible. But that started, as, as the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That started with fearing the Lord. Anybody else? All right. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, Solomon tells this, tells us this, that this is the end of the matter, right? So in Ecclesiastes, if you've ever read the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon is struggling with the pointlessness of life. And as you read, you'll, you'll understand that what he's really talking about is a life outside of God, right? So... When he gets to the end of the book, when he gets to the end of Ecclesiastes, after 12 chapters, he tells us everything has been said. He said, this is the end of the matter. Fear the Lord and obey his commands, because this is the whole duty of man. That's it. That's, that was the extent of Solomon's wisdom. The, you understand, right, that Solomon was supposedly the wisest person on the face of the earth, right? He was, you know, when God told him, I will do anything you want for you. I will give you whatever it is you want. Solomon said, Lord, give me wisdom. And God gave him wisdom. He said, I'm going to give you wisdom, you know, like I've never given anybody else wisdom, and, and, and I never will again. So Solomon was the wisest person that ever walked the face of the earth. This was his conclusion. He said, fear the Lord and obey his commands, because this is the whole duty of man, period. Hebrews 12, 28 to 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. And there's that word, right? Reverence. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about that fear, like, oh, God's going to stop on me if I get out of line. No, that's not what we're talking about. That's not the kind of relationship that God wants with you. That's not the kind of relationship your parents want with you, right? Like, I don't want, I don't want my kids thinking that about me. I, I want my kids to respect me. I don't want them being afraid that, that I'm constantly going to come down on them. Well, that's, God is the same way. God is a, a good father. And he wants that relationship with his children. He wants that reverence that, and that respect that he deserves. But he doesn't want you cowering. Questions on that? A comment. Go ahead. When person is like that, it makes it difficult for others to approach you. If people aren't approachable, especially your boss or someone that you need to talk to or learn from, it's hard to learn from them. Absolutely. If, if they're not approachable, if they're intimidating. Because you learn to you you learn by asking questions. And if you're afraid to ask a dumb question, then you know it shuts down learning. That's absolutely. And God is approachable. God is very approachable. You know? Absolutely. And um, which is another reason why I think it's a blessing that 
we don't see him face to face because it's harder to, I, I think in our imagination, it's easier to approach God and realize that he forgives us and, and he's not looking at us mean when he's not physically there. Uh, it's just me. Well, I mean, we've, I've talked about that before, where every, every, every human being that ever has had an encounter with the living God has ended up on their face, right? right. Because that's just how awesome God is. I mean, he is completely holy, completely separate, completely different from anything we could ever imagine. And that is our proper response if we ever do come face to face with God. We see this uh, in the story uh, with, with Peter and Jesus, right? Jesus, when Jesus told Peter, throw your, you know, let's go out and catch some fish. And Peter said, hey, we've been fishing all night and caught nothing. And, and he said, but you know what, Lord, because you said so, I'll throw the nets out. He goes out and throws the nets out, and they catch so many fish that the boat starts to sink. Peter, in that moment, Peter looks at Jesus and he sees the living God. And what is Peter's response? I mean, Peter, the big tough Peter, right? Big, muscular, you know, sometimes addle-brained Peter, right? This big, tough, muscular dude throws himself at Jesus' feet. That's the response. And he says, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful person. I don't even deserve to be in your presence. So you're right. If we, if we came face to face with God, we come face to face with our own inadequacies. But that is why the, the Holy Spirit is here to help us. The Holy Spirit gives us that grace to come to God. And the Bible says that we can come to God. We can come boldly to the throne of grace. That, that curtain that separated us, that curtain in the temple, right? If you remember when the temple was created, or when the tabernacle and then the temple was created, there was the holy place and there was the holy of holies. The holy of holies was where God would dwell. And there was a very thick curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. That was a physical representation of our separation from God. But the Bible says that when Jesus died, the temple curtain was torn from top to bottom. There's no longer a separation. Because of Jesus' blood, because we carry the blood of Jesus on us, we can come boldly to the throne of grace when we need him. And that's where, where the and that's the difference between fear in a negative content, context, or this reverence that we're talking about, this positive context of fearing the Lord. It's like we can come boldly because we know God cares for us. We don't come boldly saying because we deserve anything. We come boldly because of who God is. That's good. See, you see what happens when you guys come in? <laughs> we have great discussions. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, so the second point. Now, this is the point that's a little more obscure, all right? And, and I didn't expect you guys really to guess this. Uh, but it is important that we tell people our story, all right? How did, the, how did Shifra and Pua, if these were Egyptians, right? Let's just assume these midwives were Egyptians, right? How did they know to fear the Lord? They worked among the Hebrews, but that's not that's not enough, right? And just working with the Hebrew midwives or with the Hebrew women was not enough. What was it that taught them to fear the Lord? It was hearing. Go ahead. I think that the, the Hebrews told their story of the wilderness and, and all that, and the Red Sea, and the, all. That. Well, this was before that. Uh, okay, sorry. This was before that. that. Okay. Yeah, no, no, but it's but you're on the right track. They told the stories of what God did for them. Before this, now this was before Moses, right? Moses was the one that wrote the first five books of the Bible. He was the one that began the written tradition of God's word. Prior to this, it was an oral tradition. They passed on God's law from, from person to person through telling the stories of God. They told how God chose Abraham. And they, they told the stories about how Abraham got up and left his family and, and went to the, to the land that God had told him to go to. And they told him about uh, Abraham's children, about Isaac, and, and how God gave uh, Abraham Isaac at, at 95 years old or whatever, however old he was, right? I, I think he was 100, as a matter of fact, and, and Sarah was 95 or something like that, right? They told the story. 
It's like he had a child in his old age when he was all dried up. And they told the story of Isaac, who, who had Jacob and Esau, and how God blessed Jacob. And, and Jacob went to, to a land, and he was treated like a slave, but God blessed him anyway. And God gave him 12 children. And they told about Joseph, and why they ended up in Egypt in the first place. They said Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, but God was with him in the house of Potiphar. And even when Potiphar's wife accused him falsely, he was thrown in prison. God was with him in the prison. And when Pharaoh had a dream, God, God brought Joseph in to interpret Pharaoh's dream and to save Egypt. They told these stories. And this is how these, these women, heard, they heard these stories and they knew, at least they knew the part about Egypt, right? They understood the history uh, surrounding Joseph and Egypt. And they said, look, God has been with this people. And here they are in a foreign land and they're multiplying like crazy. And, and you, know, they're, they're, you know, Pharaoh is so afraid of them that he's trying to get rid of them. And they process these things. They process all these stories. And they realized, you know what? These gods of Egypt are nothing compared to the, to, to the gods of the Hebrews, to the God of the Hebrews. And they came to know the God, the true, one true God, because the Israelites told them the story of, of God's provision for them. That's how we are, that's how we are supposed to act with the people around us. When we get the opportunities, we should tell them our stories. This is why, guys, you guys, you know, my mother questioned me on this one time. She said, why are you always telling people how often you mess up? I said, you know what, because it's one thing to teach you or to tell you that God can raise you up, right? I can, I can sit here all day long and say, God can raise you up. He can pull you out of the mire. He can, wherever you are, if you're deep in depression, he can heal you. I can tell you all that. But if I've never experienced it, it's, it's not going to come out the same way. Now, when I sit here and I tell you, I suffered from clinical depression for 30 years. I was twice in my life. I was one step away from committing suicide. One time I had a knife on my, on my wrist. Literally, I had a knife on my wrist. And God saved me. Does that, does that hit you a little differently? Does that hit you a little differently? To know that I experienced that. I experienced the salvation of God. And today I can tell you I am completely at peace. I have not experienced a depression or anxiety for the last 12 years now since God healed me. Does that, does that touch you in a different way? That's what we're talking about here. That's what we're talking about. That's why everybody who, I let everybody know, everybody that knows me, anybody who's ever talked to me for more than five minutes knows that if they ever suffer from depression, they can come and talk to me. I encourage them. I, I will tell people all the time, if you ever feel depressed, if you ever feel like you're, you're spiraling, call me. Because I've been there. And that's what we need to be doing, guys. Look, that's not easy. Because, let's face it, that's inconvenient. When people call you in the middle of the night because they're upset or they're depressed or, or, or you're in the middle of something important and they call you and they're just spiraling and you got to stop what you're doing. That it takes, it, it, it is inconvenient, but you know what? That's what God has called us to. I mean, what is this life about except affecting the people that God has placed in your life? God has placed those people in your life for a reason. You're, you're in a specific family for a reason. You're in your job for a reason. You're in your neighborhood for a reason. You're in this church for a reason. That reason is those people that surround you in every single one of those places. We need to tell our stories. Tell people what God has done for you. And if you've been, if you've been in the Lord for more than six months... God has done something for you. As a matter of fact, if you've come to know Jesus Christ, already God has done something for you, right? Because He forgave your sin. He wiped the slate clean. Even if you have nothing else to say, you can say, hey, I was blind, but now I see. 
I was lost, but now I'm found. That's what we need. We need to tell people. You know, because look, they can they can doubt God's word if they want to. They can they can say, oh, that's just an ancient document written hundreds of years ago. It doesn't have any relevance for me today. But when I look them in the eye and I tell them, you know what? God healed me from depression. They can't doubt that. Because they can look me in the eye and know it's true. They can, you can look me in the eye. When I tell that story, you can look me in the eye and tell that I'm telling you the truth. God healed me completely and totally. I am at 100% peace. A peace that I never even thought was possible. I lived my whole life wanting this peace, but never thinking that it was even possible. Thinking that life was just anxiety. And God healed me. God brought peace into my heart. A peace that passes all understanding. Now, even when things go wrong, even if my employer was to tell me that I'm going to lose my job on October 25th, it's just an example. <laughs> <laughs> even if that were to happen, hypothetically speaking, even if that were to happen, I can be at peace. Because I know what God has done for me in the past. And I know he's not going to abandon me now. Amen. Comments, questions. Amen. <laughs> so that's why it's, it's, you have to tell the story, all the sides. Because sometimes people are just like, oh, they bless Sarah, they have, she has a baby, so what? But then they said that um, Abraham was his word. He got blind because he didn't believe. So God goes yeah. Well, and it's important. I, I think it is important to tell the whole story, right? It, 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 it's important to tell. That's why I tell you guys when I mess up. Like, I tell you guys all, you know, I don't, look, okay, I'm not specific. I, don't, I haven't told you specifically, uh, you know, the people that I've hurt because that, that just serves no purpose. But I will tell you the kind of person I was because that's part of the story. How do you, you know, you know that this is a miracle that I'm sitting here in comparison to what I was before. And you don't have to take my word for it. When my wife is here, you can ask her, because she knew that idiot, mm -hmm. okay? She knew that jerk 27 years ago, okay? So you can ask her if you want to. You don't have to take my word for it, but I can tell you uh, that I was not a good person back then. I was angry most of the time. I was short-tempered. You know, going back to Bruce's point about, you know, being approachable, I was not approachable. My kids were afraid to approach me sometimes because I had such a short fuse. And I always tell people, I didn't just have a short fuse. My, sh my fuse came pre-lit. So that's, that's what I'm talking about, guys. So when you talk to me now and you see the, the peace in my eyes, and you, you see the patience with, with, with which I deal with people, you can think to yourself, now, you can think to yourself like my, one of my young people, she, she, she looked at me straight in the eye and said, no, you're lying to us, I don't believe that. Because I don't believe you were ever like that. <laughs> now you can think that, or you can understand that I am telling you the truth, and God worked a miracle in my life. And more importantly, if God can do it for me, he can do it for you too. Whatever it is that you need from God, whatever needs to change in you, whatever provision you need in your life, God will provide. But yeah, it is important. We tell the whole story, right? That's part of the story. That's why I tell you guys that. I'm, I'm not perfect. I never have been. You know, I know, I, I know too many pastors that try to project that aura of perfection, right? Not helpful. Not helpful at all. I, I, I have trouble speaking to people like that. Uh, because if, look, if you can't understand what I'm saying, look, you don't have to actually have gone through everything that I've gone through to understand, to be empathetic. But if you haven't gone through it, and when I'm talking to you, then I at least need to see that empathy in your eyes. But I've known too many people that I talk to and there's no empathy whatsoever. They don't understand what I'm talking about. So I, I have trouble trusting people that, that have that facade of perfection. Because I know it's, that's all it is. It's a mask. So we do need to tell the whole story. 
And look, there are people, there are people that are still in my life that know that story. They, they knew the, the old me. So I wouldn't be able to lie about it anyway. <laughs> you know? If I were to tell you guys, you know, how, how perfect I was, if my wife were sitting here, right, you could see the look on her face, right, if I were to say that. And you'd be like, wait, wait, why is she looking like that? You know? It's like, he's not telling us the truth. No, but when I, when I do tell you what a terrible person I was, and my wife is sitting there, she's going, oh, yeah. That was, yeah, that's true. So, anybody else? In uh, Revelation chapter 12, right? We, the, the Bible talks about the rise of the beast. And the beast comes and he attacks the children of God. And what does the Bible say? They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So it is important to speak, to tell the story, right? The Bible says that, uh, you know, uh, the faith comes by hearing, right? It doesn't say faith comes by reading. It says faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word of God. So, uh, you know, all these Christians I talk to, they say, well, you just got to live your life in, in Christ that people will, will notice that. That's true. But eventually you do have to tell them why you are living the way that you are living. Eventually you've got to tell them that it's not you living that way, but it's Christ in you that is allowing you to live that way. So, so how did the midwives come to fear the Lord? Because the people of Israel told their stories, and the people of Israel remained faithful in hardship. See, this is the other thing that we, when we talk about telling our story, right? So when I tell you that, that God has done great things for me, that God has been there for me in my, in my toughest times, and if I were to tell you, hypothetically speaking, that I'm going to lose my job come October 25th, if I were to tell you that, and I were to look panicked about it and be fearful about it. Would you believe me when I told when I tell you that God can be there for you in your darkest hour? It's like you might doubt that because if you don't see it in me, then why would you believe me when I tell it to you? But if I hypothetically speaking tell you, <laughs> if I tell you hypothetically speaking that I'm going to lose my job on October 25th. But I, I, you look in my eyes and you see the peace that I'm living with and, you, and, and I tell you, I know that God's going to provide for me and for my family. Then when you start going through something like that, you can remember, you can remember that you saw Pastor Fernando go through that. It's like, hey, I, I, I remember Pastor Fernando had this same experience and he was able to trust God even in the midst of that. And so you know what? I'm going to trust God even in the midst of that. So that's, that's the other part of this, guys. It's not only about telling your stories. It's about living those stories. When, when you tell people that you've learned something from God, they should see you living that way. And if they see, like if I tell you that, you know, uh, God healed me from road rage, right? That I no longer have road rage. And you just happen to be on the highway with me, <laughs> right? And you cut me off, and I start losing my mind, and giving you some hand gestures that I shouldn't be giving. And then I come to church that next Sunday and I tell you, oh yeah, I no longer run rage. Yeah. yeah. Are you going to believe that? Um, yeah. Of course not. Yeah. But if I tell you, look, God no longer, you know, I, I no longer have road rage, and you happen to be on the highway with me, and you see somebody cut me off, and you see me slow down, and then you see the smile on my face, and then you're like, hey, He's telling the truth. He doesn't have a problem with road rage anymore. See, my wife is another one who, she will testify to that. Because my wife used to hate driving with me. I was a mess, okay? I can't believe nobody killed me on the, on the highway, okay? That's how bad I was, all right? But my wife now, it's, it's hilarious because now somebody will cut me off, my wife will be the one to say, honk him, he shouldn't have done that. And I'm like, no, no, it's good. I'm just going to slow down. It's, it's okay. You know, and, and that, guys, that's a miracle. You guys don't even understand what a miracle that is. But see, that's, that's part of the story, right? That's the whole story. I had a problem, and I'm always afraid. I, I know, I know this is going to happen one day. I'm going to be preaching. I'm going to be talking about this. And somebody's going to be looking at me like, wait a minute. I remember you, you know. You're the guy that flipped me off on the highway 20 years ago. 
I just I know that's gonna happen one day, okay? I just know. Because I, I it happens so often. There's so many people that 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 experience that from me that I know one day I'm gonna run into them. So but I can tell you, you know, God healed me. God healed me from the anger that I felt. And I, you know, and because of that. You know, when you go through whatever it is that you're going to go through, because look, we all are going to go through something. Mm -hmm. We are all going to go through hardship. That's just how life is. Life is hard sometimes. So when you go through hardship, I hope that you can remember what I've told you. I hope that you can remember that, that I am at peace, that you see the peace in my eyes, that you see the peace with which I live. And that peace can help you also to trust God and live in peace. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13. So these things happen to them as examples, and we're written down, and actually this is not 1 through 13. I think this is 10 through 13. But anyway, these things happen to them as examples, and we're written down as warnings for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can you know how you can believe that? Because I've lived that. And I'm telling you that story. I'm telling you my story about how God brought me out of those temptations. And you can see me living that. If by any chance, hypothetically speaking, <laughs> I end up losing my job, you can see the peace with which I live and how I can trust God. Hypothetically speaking. <laughs> Questions, comments? Come on, I talked for a long time. You gotta have some comments. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the last point. Huh? Somebody say something? Or was that just an echo? <laughs> I talked too loud, that's the problem. Uh, the last point is God will reward our obedience. Okay? Now, God, the Bible says in this, in this passage, right? Shepherd and poor, uh, God allowed them to have families of their own. Now, I don't know how old they were. I don't know if they were barren. I'm, I, I believe because the Bible tells us that, I tend to believe that they were barren up until this point. That they could not have children of their own. Now, I don't know that the Bible does not say that. That's just my opinion. But that's what, I, you know, I, I tend to believe that because that's what the, the Bible says that God allowed them to have families. So something, something was going on there where they were, not, they, they were not able to have families of their own. Up until this point. But God blessed them with families of their own. Because God will bless our obedience. Amen. Now that doesn't mean that obedience is going to be easy. I mean this must have been very hard for them. Facing Pharaoh. Again this Pharaoh was God. To the Egyptians. And he was all powerful. If he said die. You die. That was it. And, and these, these women. I mean, they're just midwives. They're not like they're not like the wives of prominent officials or or even Pharaoh's daughters or something like that. These are just midwives, and they are standing up to Pharaoh, and they are disobeying Pharaoh. And if Pharaoh would have examined it a little further, he would have found out that they were deceiving, and they would have lost their lives. And they knew that. They knew that at some that Pharaoh could have. Have, could have executed them. But they chose to fear the Lord and to obey God. And God blessed them. You know, sometimes God blesses you uh, by, by giving you pleasant circumstances. Sometimes God blesses you by bringing you through difficult circumstances. You don't always, we don't always get uh, the, the, the immediate blessing. Sometimes you got to endure the storm first. And in 1 Samuel 15, 22 and 23, it says, But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to eat is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance is like the evil of adultery. It's all about obedience. You know, it, it's not about the rituals. We, 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 we still tend to believe in the back of our minds, right? If I just do the right thing, right? If I do the right thing, then God will bless me. If I give the right amount of money, if I go to church enough, if I, you know, if I say enough prayers, 
then God will bless me. It's not about the ritual. Look, all of those things are important. Prayer, Bible reading, giving of your tithes and offerings, all of that is important. But the first thing, the most important thing is to obey God. It is, it is all about obedience. Jesus himself said, if you love me, keep my commands. That's how we prove our love for God. We keep his commands. We keep the things that he tells us to keep. And when he tells us, you know, not to, uh, uh, not to commit adultery, then we don't commit adultery. And, we, you know, and if we do commit adultery, we don't make excuses for it. We don't say, well, if my husband were a better husband, I wouldn't have to do that. Or if my wife would, would do this for me, then I wouldn't have to go seeking love elsewhere. No, that's just excuses, guys. And, you know, we're very good at that. Right? We're very good at making excuses, right? Whenever we, whenever we compromise, we're very good at making excuses. And this is, this is especially true you know, in relationships. When, when, you, when, you're, when you have those emotions churning, right? It's like we, you, you really love somebody. And, and this is especially true with young people because your passions are so intense. I'm looking at you guys. <laughs> Your passions are so intense at that age that it, you know, you can justify just about anything. And I remember that. It was many, many years ago, but I do remember that feeling. And that's why I, I you know, I miss being a, a youth pastor. I really do. Because being able to, to, to mentor young people is so important as they're going through those, those changes. But Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's not about, you know, your excuses. It's not about what, it's not even about what I tell you. I, I, look, I'll tell you guys all the time, go get into God's Word. Because if I tell you something that's not in God's Word, how are you going to know? How are you going to know if you haven't studied God's Word for yourself? And I would expect you, if I, if I come to you with something that's not in God's Word, and, and I don't specifically say that this is not in God's Word, like I just did before, like, if I'm telling you something that's not in God's Word, I'm probably going to tell you, hey, this is just my opinion, it's not in God's Word. But if I, tell you that, if I tell you something that's not in God's Word, and I make it sound like it's in God's Word, I would expect one of you to come and correct me. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a pastor like that, but that's just, that's the way I choose to pastor. I expect you guys to correct me if I say something that's not in God's Word, and I, and I present it as if it's in God's Word. I would expect one of you to come and correct me. Because I fear the Lord. And I'm going to listen to you because I fear the Lord. And I want to get this right. You know why? Because the Bible says that teachers will be judged more severely. So not only do I expect you to correct me if I say something wrong, I need you to do that. Because I'm going to be judged more severely in the day of judgment. The Bible says that teachers are going to be judged more severely. So when I stand before God, I am going to give account for every single thing I said in, in his name. So I'm going to be, you guys aren't going to be judged for that. So if I say something wrong, you guys aren't going to be judged for that. I will be. So I, and not only do I expect you to correct me if I say something wrong, I need that. I need you to correct me. And I can tell you that I will listen to you. Because I fear the Lord. And if you come to me with, with biblical proof, you better come with the Word of God. That's the one thing I will tell you. You better come with the Word of God. Because I'm going to have the Word ready to go. But you better come with the Word of God. If you come with the Word of God, then I'm going to stop and say, you know what? You're right. i got to study that. I'm going to go look, look through that and, and, and make sure that, that I get this right the next time. Because I fear the Lord. And one of, one of the things that Jesus commands is that we, that we correct each other. That's what the Bible says the church is for, right? It's like we spur one another on to greater works. That doesn't just mean that you guys with each other. That includes me. That includes me. You guys can come and, and, and treat me that way as well. If you, can, you know, if you can talk with each other and correct each other, you should be able to correct me as well. If you see something in my life that, that shouldn't be there. That wasn't really the, the, the direction I wanted to go. I don't know where that came from, but anyway. So praise God. Amen. Questions, comments. Would you guys be afraid of that? Would you guys be nervous coming to me and trying to correct me? No. 
Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know you would. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I will be honest. I used to, I used to be, I, I used to feel that way. Uh, as, as I've grown in the Lord, I realized that a pastor is just another servant. And that's how I view my ministry. I'm just another servant, just like you guys. The, the only difference between me and you is God called me to be the pastor. That was it. Go ahead. For me, it's more of, um, uh, you know, if you, there is an expert in this field of something, and they said something like, oh, wait a minute, that's not right. I would be a little nervous to go to them because they are the expert. Even if I know that what I'm saying is right, going to the expert is like, mm -hmm. so it's, it, you know. I get it. I get it, because you guys, you guys should expect me to know God's Word. I've been studying God's Word for over 20 years, uh, so I should know God's Word, right? Mm -hmm. I do forget sometimes, like, that you guys will, you know, I'll say something like, wait, wait, that's not quite right. But, yeah, I should know God's Word, but you know what? Uh, even an expert can be wrong from time to time, right? Even an expert, you know, can, can get something wrong. So it's, it, is, it is possible for me to, to make a mistake. You know, I'm not perfect. I never have. I, I will never claim to be perfect. Go ahead. The the thing here is the interpretation of things, because when you read the Bible, you might interpret it one way, and then uh, another person will interpret it a different way, and then that doesn't mean that we are wrong. Even you think it is, it's just interpretation we're giving to the words. Okay, I like that. That's true. There are going to be things that maybe we disagree on. But it is just interpretation. But that's why I always tell people, you, you, you cannot interpret a scripture by itself. You have to interpret each scripture in light of all the other scriptures that are written in the Bible. And here's a great example, and I did not mean to go here, but we are here, and I'm going to go here, okay? The Baptist Church, the Southern Baptist Convention, does not allow women to be pastors. And they do that because in, in a, one of Paul's letters... He says, I do not allow women to have authority over men. Okay, so they take this one scripture, and, and they interpret it to mean that women should not be pastors. Now, on the surface, it does sound like that, right? But there's two things about that. First of all, let me ask you a question. Would God ever violate his own will? Right? That, that would be silly, right? We, don't, we know that God is perfect. His will is perfect. So he would never violate his will. So wait a minute. If it is God's will that women should never exercise authority over men, then why did he choose Deborah to judge Israel during the, the time of the judges? If, if God's will is that women should not be in authority over men, then what you're telling me is God violated his own will by choosing Deborah as a judge over Israel. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, there was many more in the Bible. Oh yeah, there was many more. That's the one I always go to because that's the one that most people know. There was the one that people know right off the top of their head. But that's but there are more. It, it wasn't just them. So if God will not violate His will, and God did choose women at certain points in Scripture to have authority over men, then what do we say about that Scripture? It was Paul's opinion. And actually, Paul is very clear about that. He didn't say the Lord. He said, I. He was very clear that this was his opinion. He said, I never allow women to have authority over men. He never said, God commanded me to never have women in authority over men. So, but that's, you know, when I'm talking to a Baptist, that's something you want to be very careful about. Because they're, they're, there, there is a way to beat somebody over the head with their knowledge, right? And that's not what we're about. That shouldn't be what we're about. You know, uh, they, they, there's that old saying, right? A little knowledge is, is a dangerous thing, right? Well, sometimes we can be very dangerous when we have a little knowledge. And we, we try to make other people feel stupid for having a contrary opinion. But you know what? There are things that we can disagree about that don't have to do with salvation. So you know what, it's not, you know, the Baptists are going to be saved because they believe in Jesus Christ. They believe 
in the Lordship of Jesus Christ and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible tells us. If you believe in your heart, or if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Period. It doesn't say if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and have perfect theology for the rest of your life, you will be saved. It doesn't say that. We just confess Jesus is Lord, we believe that God raised him from the dead, and we are saved. And we can argue about everything else, okay? And it's okay. It would be okay to disagree on that point because it has nothing to do with salvation. Even though I, I, I think, you know, the, the Southern Baptist Convention is, is, is wrong in its thinking, they're not going to be, they're not going to be condemned to hell for that. They're still going to be in heaven with us. And, and that's what, and that's the biggest thing we need to understand, guys. Just because people disagree with us doesn't mean that they're not serving the Lord. We do have to agree on the essentials. And what we're talking about today, the fear of the Lord, that's one of the essentials. That is one of the things the Bible is perfectly clear about. And, and, I, and I've done a study on, uh, on a, a series on this before. The, the things that the Bible is perfectly clear about. Right? Repentance is one of those things. Repentance means to turn around. You, you uh, realize that you are, you are living the wrong way. You turn around and you start living God's way. That's repentance. Holiness is what we're talking about here. Obeying God. Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commands. That's holiness. The fear of the Lord is what we're talking about today. That's the third thing that the Bible is clear about. The fear of the Lord is what keeps us living holy lives. Because we, we respect God. We have a reverence for God. Because we, we recognize who he is. We recognize his authority. Just like if you were to meet the President of the United States, right? If you were to meet the President of the United States, you would, you would respect the fact that this is the President. Whether you voted for them or not, you would respect the fact that this is the leader of the free world. Well, you know what? God is the judge of the entire universe, and we need to respect His position as God. This went in an entirely different direction, but praise God, <laughs> we're going to go. You know? <laughs> Any questions on that? Does that hold together? Did that make sense? See, because that's, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about interpreting the Word of God. You can only interpret God's Word by interpreting all of God's Word. And this is the problem with a lot of the sects of Christianity that take Bible verses out of context. And, and they don't they don't interpret them in light of all of scripture. That's why you read the whole book, not just exactly. You gotta you gotta study the whole word. And that's why I tell you guys, if you're gonna tell me that I'm wrong about something, you gotta bring the word, man. You gotta bring it all. Not just one verse, you gotta bring all the word. Go ahead. I think uh, as Christians we're all individual and we all have our own unique convictions. Mm -hmm. And my conviction, I can't put on you. You have to get your convictions from God. There was an older lady that I knew, and she, her, God told her, don't read any fiction, only read nonfiction. Well, that was her conviction, you know? And she wouldn't read any of my nonfiction I wrote. <laughs> she said, God wants me to only read, you know? And I respected that. You know, but she wasn't forcing that on me, and I wasn't forcing that on her. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is what Paul would describe as disputable matters. And there were those same uh, controversies in Paul's time. And that's why he told the church, he's like, don't, don't get caught up in these things. You know, we have a tendency to believe that uh, how we interpret certain scriptures is the only way to interpret certain scriptures. But like I said, as long as it doesn't deal with the essentials, there are things the Bible is clear on. And as long as we're not talking about those things, there are other things that are not so clear. Like my mother, my mother is one of those people who will abstain from alcohol completely. Now the Bible doesn't say that. But we've, we've had this discussion. I was like, Mom, the Bible only says do not get drunk because that leads to debauchery. So it's okay if I, if I go to a, a, a restaurant and I see a fellow Christian having a glass of wine or a glass of beer with dinner, you know, 20 years ago, my mom would have been scandalized by that. 
like, oh my God, these people went to church on Sunday and were praising God. Here they are just drinking up, you know. <laughs> but my mother's come to realize that it's, it, you know, having one glass of wine or one glass of beer is, as long as it doesn't get you drunk, now look, you should know your limits. <laughs> Some of us can get drunk on one, so understand that. And that's why a lot of people do abstain. But understand that that's not the sin. If Now, if that person were to get drunk, if I see that person later in the evening, and they're having to be carried out of the restaurant, you know what? The Bible's clear on that. It says, do not get drunk, because that leads to debauchery. Bruce? Uh, some, sometimes that, that's a cultural thing. And people grow up with that. You know? and, and it gets back to knowing yourself. You know, if you know that you have an addictive personality, and you know that you don't even want to go down that road, then it's good for you just to, you know what I'm saying? And uh, that, can, that can lead into a slippery slope, you know, all that stuff. Like one guy said, I know I can never get drunk if I never take the first drink. <laughs> you know what I'm well, that's and, true. I mean, that's, that's his conviction, you know, that's where he's and, at. And that's the thing, but we need to be careful not to, uh, not to quote that as scripture, because that's not what the scripture says. Just right? To, we do need to understand what the scripture actually says. Go ahead. If they're, they're drunk, especially guys, just tell the story of Noah. There you go. And they will stop drinking for you. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to go into that. But I, you know, I'm going to let that comment sit because I agree with <laughs> And on that note, someone had said to me that before the flood, because the atmosphere is different, things didn't ferment, maybe. There was a scientific point to that. After the flood, the atmosphere wasn't as dense and stuff, and things probably could have, maybe it was an accident. He didn't know that his wine would turn into, you know, yeah. and let it sit there for he, a couple of months. He didn't realize how strong it was, right? Well, he didn't know that that would happen. I mean, I just, but, my interpretation, well, well, I heard, you know, I said, yeah. again, interpretation. Yeah, but <laughs> so to get back to the main point is, you know, on those points, uh, and this is the thing, this is the, the argument I have with my mother, right? So we know that God's word is perfect, right? God's law is perfect. We all believe that. And yet we, we constantly try to help God. We are constantly trying to help God. Now, Mike, we were very guilty of this, uh, you know, 30, 30 years ago when I was growing up in the church. You know, uh, you know, there was a strict dress code. Women could not wear pants. Uh, you could not wear makeup. You could not, neither, neither one of us could wear jewelry of any kind except a wedding ring. That was the only thing you were allowed Right? So, none of that is in Scripture. None of that is in Scripture, but we believe that we needed to help God. It's like, oh, we're not even going to get, we're not even going to get close to it. We're going we're gonna to take like 10 steps away from that to make sure that we don't violate God's law. And, and that's, that's the difference, guys, between religion and relationship. See, religion is constantly binding you. It's constantly putting rules on you. Relationship actually frees you. That's what Jesus says. If it, you know, I have come for you to be free. If the Son sets you free, you are free. So I don't have to live by those constraining rules. As long as I know God's word and I fear the Lord and I obey God's word, I am free to live this life that God has given me. So we need to understand that. And and look, religion is is negative. Because when you start putting, piling these rules on top of people, this is what turned a lot of people off from the church. And I'll tell you something else. Religion is the reason why we don't know how to pronounce God's true name. Do you know, in, in the scripture, God's true name, when the one he revealed to Moses, he said, this is my name, this is how I am, the, the Israelites are to, to, to call me. It is four letters. Uh, in, in Hebrew, it's Y-H-W-H. Now, we pronounce that Yahweh, right? But that's not, we don't know if that's the actual pronunciation. You know why we don't know what the pronunciation is? It's because the Jews got so religious, they decided that they shouldn't even say God's name. So even when they were reading the scriptures, and the name Yahweh came up in the scriptures, they would substitute the name as a noun. So they wouldn't even, when they're reading the scriptures, they wouldn't even read God's name. They had gotten so religious that they believed that, you know, in order not to take the Lord's name in vain, we're not even going to say God's name. So we can make sure we never take his name in vain. 
And you know, and you know what? We're suffering the consequences of that because now we don't know God's true name anymore. God revealed it to Moses. And he said, and, and you know what? Inadvertently, they actually violated God's command. He said, this is the name I'm supposed to be known by. He said, this is what you are to call me. And the Israelites lost the pronunciation of God's name because they got so religious. They tried to help God. The command wasn't good enough, right? It's like, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Oh, well, that's not good enough. We're just not even going to say God's name at all. And now, because of that, we don't know how to pronounce God's true name. That's the danger of religion, guys. We lose what it is that God's trying to give us sometimes. They lost that, and, and you can look at this as just losing that personal relationship with God. I mean, can you have a personal relationship with me if you don't know my name? Like, if someone were to ask you, if somebody, you know, you were to say, oh, I have this friend over there, and, and oh, we're good friends, and, uh, you know, and say, oh, what's, what's your friend's name? It's like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> that doesn't make sense, right? You can't, you can't really be in a relationship with somebody if you don't know their name. Well, the Israelites, in, in some respects, they lost that relationship with God because they lost the name of God. <coughs> anyway, that's kind of sad, right? <laughs> Any questions on that? I mean, we've gone way off of what I intended, but praise God. <laughs> that's the great thing about these open discussions, right? We can just take these little rabbit trails wherever they be. Because we like rabbits, too. That's right. We love rabbits. So <laughs> we get the rabbit. We get the rabbit. We cook them up, and it comes out. So it comes out delicious. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? All right, let's pray. And we Father, we just come to the name of Jesus. We thank you, dear God. We thank you, Lord, because we are reverently and wonderfully made, dear God. And because of that, we recognize who you are, dear God, and we revere you, dear God. We respect who you are. And we worship you, dear God, because it is your due. Help us to continue to fear you, Lord. To have that genuine, proper respect for your word, Lord. That is our prayer. Bless these people as they go. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you, church.